there is no end game in Afghanistan, right? Uh, there is always the end game is the beginning of a new grade. Welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Surya Gangadharan. I have with me Sushant Sareen. He's a well-known uh, writer, commentator on Pakistan and Afghanistan. And we're going to talk to him about Afghanistan, uh, especially in the context of the recent visit by an Indian delegation, official delegation of the MEA, uh, which was in Kabul uh, last week. Uh, Sushant, um, what is your understanding of uh, what this visit was about? What were we trying to achieve? Um, anything you can tell us? See, this is not the first time uh, Indian officials are going to Kabul. Uh, in fact, um, it's become a pretty normal thing for Indian officials to go. Maybe not at this level. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, it's very clear that the government of India has decided that uh, the uh, path forward is to engage the Taliban. Uh, and I, as I often say, engagement is not endorsement. Yeah. There are many issues on which uh, we uh, find some Taliban practices abhorrent. Uh, but we are not going to let that stop engagement. Um, at the same time, we are not going to be uh, breaking the international consensus. We have our own compulsions and our own requirements. Uh, for which we think we need to engage the Taliban. Uh, but there is an international consensus and I don't think uh, people in government uh, have any intention of breaking with that international consensus. So there is going to be no recognition uh, for the Taliban uh, regime just yet. And to that extent, we'll stay with the international consensus. Uh, but at the same time, there are humanitarian imperatives, people-to-people uh, -people, uh, imperatives that we have to cater for, for which we will engage with the Taliban. Uh, and to some extent, if we can carry out some developmental work and which will ease the lives of the Afghan people, because at the end of the day, I think, uh, and again, this is my interpretation, uh, I think there are basically two broad pillars of Indian policy towards Afghanistan, always have been. One, we will deal with whoever is in government in Kabul uh, and provided they will also deal with us. So uh, if the Taliban are ready to uh, engage with us, we will engage with them because they are the de facto uh, government. Uh, and second, uh, we will not let go of our relationship with the Afghan people. And to the extent possible, whatever we can do to ease their lives to whatever extent it is possible for us, that we will do. So the humanitarian assistance uh, becomes a part and parcel of uh, one of the pillars of Indian policy. That, that's what uh, I gather from how things have been unfolding. You know, when the Taliban took over, there was a lot of talk about India having lost ground in Afghanistan. You uh, know, kind of the $2 billion or $3 billion that we'd invested. Uh, everybody said it's been written off. Um, I mean, how do you see that? Yeah, look, number one, I find this whole talk of two, three billion dollars. You know, at one level, we are saying that we are a three, three and a half trillion dollar economy going on to become a five trillion dollar economy. And we are talking about two billion, three. That's piddly amounts. I, you know, so I think we demean ourselves by talking about two, three billion dollars. And two, three billion dollars spread over 20 years do the math, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think what was important from the Indian developmental uh, profile was uh, that we uh, catered whatever development we were doing, whatever monies we were spending, we catered it around Afghan needs. Unlike many of the other Western donors and others uh, who decided what the priorities for the Afghans should be, uh, we decided that let the Afghans tell us what their priorities are and we'll cater to that. Uh, so our developmental uh, projects produce the maximum bang for the buck. Uh, but aside of this 2-3 billion, there were a lot of doomsday scenarios that were painted. India is out, India has been worsted, Pakistan has won. If this is what victory looks like, uh, I wish it all the more to Pakistan, right? Um, I wish many more such victories to them, but uh, but yeah, they see some of that uh, some of that uh, 
despondency which was there in August of 2021 is understandable because uh, the Taliban was seen as proxies of Pakistan. For 20 years, the Pakistanis had sponsored them. They had gone against the international community, international consensus, given them safe havens, armed them, equipped them, done everything possible. Uh, so we saw the Taliban as pa Pakistani proxies. Uh, and, and we must remember that the Taliban also attacked us inside Afghanistan. So there was, there was naturally some degree of apprehension uh, among many circles. But I think, you know, uh, there were some people like us who were also saying that, look, there is no end game in Afghanistan, yeah. right? Uh, there is always the end game is the beginning of a new great game. And frankly, uh, eventually there will be some problems which will crop up between the Taliban and the Pakistanis and that will be uh, that will open doors for us. Now go back to the 90s right when the when the Mujahideen uh, defeated the Najibullah government took over Kabul uh, even at that point of time because we were with the Afghan government uh, and in some in some ways uh, we ended up on the wrong side of history uh, there was this sense that, you know, we might not be able to stay in Afghanistan. But from 92 to 96, for example, as long as the, the Mujahideen was still running the government, uh, we didn't have an ambassador in Kabul, but we had an embassy out there. And, uh, and within weeks of the Mujahideen taking over, uh, you would remember that there, were, there was a, a fight which started between the Pakistanis and uh, the incumbents in Kabul. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we became, you know, and it's a natural course of thing. My enemy's enemy is my friend. So the moment an Afghan fights with the Pakistanis, the first thing he does is reaches out to us and we are always ready, right? It's the same thing has happened this time. So now, I think what was important is that for the Taliban, uh, there was this one, the Taliban knew the kind of treachery that the Pakistanis are capable of. And they were very wary of the Pakistanis. Second, the Taliban wanted uh, to ensure that, you know, they could address the feeling which many, for example, the Indians had that the Taliban are Pakistani proxies. The, Talibani, the Taliban wanted to show that they're not Pakistani proxies, that they are their own masters, that yes, they needed the Pakistanis uh, when uh, they were not in control. But now that they are in control, uh, they have their own agency and they don't need the Pakistanis. So they are not going to follow Pakistani diktat. Now, the best way you show to the world that you are your own person, you have your own agency uh, for an Afghan is to reach out to India, mm. right? How else do you show that I've broken the shackles of slavery of Pakistan, to use the very evocative phrase of Imran Khan? So for a for, for any Afghan to show that he is not a Pakistani puppet, he reaches out to India, which is exactly what the Taliban did. And I think the determination which was made in New Delhi was that, look, let's test it out. So we waited, we, we took our time and then finally when we realized that, uh, yes, uh, security will be ensured, some of our concerns will be addressed, the government decided to open a technical mission. It's not a full-fledged embassy, but it, it is, you know, we have boots on ground as far as Afghanistan is concerned, um, which actually is a kind of a complete turnaround to the kind of doom and gloom scenarios that were painted in August of 2021. Within an year, we were back in. Today, um, we are embedded in Kabul uh, and there... I, don't be surprised if going forward, you see a couple of consulates opening up. Mm -hmm. yeah, there will be, be only one or two. Yeah. Uh, the Pakistanis will probably say 200 consulates have opened up um, like they used to in the past 20, 42, whatever number caught their fancy, the Pakistanis would drop it. Uh, but I think a couple of consulates are likely to open up. Some travel restrictions are likely to be eased, especially for medical tourism, maybe for education. Uh, that's the that's the hope. That's the possible way things are likely to move forward. There is also a possibility of um, 
India once again uh, getting involved in some of the developmental project, developmental work inside Afghanistan. Uh, now, all of this is going to happen despite the fact that uh, India has serious concerns over some of the policies and practices of the Taliban, especially in relation to women, yeah. which uh, I think um, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that these are very abhorrent practices, something that we cannot agree with. But that's not going to be a deal breaker. So that is one. Uh, the other is provided our security concerns are taken care of. Our concerns on terrorism uh, are taken care of. So I think that's the direction in which things are moving. As of now, the sense which one gets is that uh, the Taliban have ensured that Afghan soil is not going to be used against India. Question is whether this will be the case uh, two years, four years, five years from now. Because uh, while the Pakistani groups are not present in Afghanistan, there are other uh, equally problematic groups that are present in Afghanistan. They are not, they are not operational really. The Al Qaeda uh, in the Indian subcontinent, the AQIS, a couple of other such groups, more international jihadist groups, but which also target India. Uh, and and a lot of their propaganda is believed to uh, be coming out of Afghanistan. But like I said, they are not operational right now, but what does it take for them to become yeah, operational? Yeah. So there are those concerns that, okay, fine, right now things seem to be working out. What happens a couple of years from now? Will the Taliban um, become more moderate, more in tune with the rest of the world? Or uh, will they become more jihadist in their worldview? Uh, and that is going to be a real challenge, which is why that I think if you have a presence in Afghanistan, then uh, you can get a better idea of what direction things are moving. Mm -hmm. What about the Haqqanis? They are part of this Taliban group, but are they with them? Is there a kind of a synergy between the Kandahar clique and this lot? I think it's very clear. Look, there will always be some kind of, you know, pulls and pushes within the movement. Uh, I don't want to get into the history of the Haqqanis and, you know, their tribal affiliation and, uh, you know, that they are the Gilzais and the other guys are Durrani. I don't want to get into all of that uh, because then, you know, we could yeah, go on a couple of months, you know, a couple of years, maybe a couple of centuries discussing it. So there will be those pulls and pressures between various factions. The Haqqanis are, of course, one faction. But I think it's very clear nobody wants to... Um, break the kind of Taliban consensus, if you can call it that. Nobody wants to break that. Uh, there will be jostling for space. Uh, people will try and, you know, uh, plug their own agendas, their own worldviews, their own priorities. Uh, they will make alliances within certain factions to push things along. All of that is likely to happen. But uh, there is no indication as yet that it will descend into any kind of internecine warfare. Mm -hmm. I think that is not happening. There are no signs of that happening. There is no inclination in, of that happening. And ultimately, uh, everybody uh, kowtows to the Emir. So it's the Amir and his clique which call the final shots. So yes, people will say what they have to say. They will plug whatever line they have to plug. But the final line comes from Kandahar and then everybody kind of signs on. Yeah. It's like the Pakistan army model, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so coming to that, how can the Pakistanis never read the Taliban that they could turn, you know? Yeah, the Pakistanis are a delusional lot, you know. They, uh, they live in a world of their own make-believe, uh, alternate realities which they construct for themselves. Uh, and then they think that everything is hunky-dory. They think they are really smart people. Yeah, they are smart tactically, they are duffers strategically. You look at everything the yeah. Pakistanis have indulged in, uh, they've always had muck on their face at the end of it. Afghanistan is yet another example. They, and, and multiple times they've done these mistakes in Afghanistan, always thinking uh, that uh, they, they own the Afghans. And 
you know, there was a wise British guy, if I'm not mistaken, it was Olaf Caro, mm -hmm. who said, uh, you can never own an Afghan, you can rent him out, right? So the Pakistanis, see, the Pakistanis have a habit of treating debt as disposable income. So for them to treat rent as ownership, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. So th that's the mistake they make. And uh, I think they got it wrong. They, they thought that, and they continuously made that distinction that the TTP and the Taliban are two separate groups. They're not, they're the same, right? Uh, it's, it's a different brand name. It's like Unilever Nigeria and Unilever India. It's like, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's something like that. You yeah. know? It's the same company, different branding and local imperatives, but born out of the same womb, so as to speak. Uh, and, and, and a lot of Pakistani analysts used to point this out. It is the uh, the generals, you know, the duffers as Asma Jahangir called them, mm. who were convinced that no, the TTP are bad Taliban, the Afghan Taliban are good Taliban. And now suddenly, Everybody's they bad. don't know where to duck for cover. So now again, you know, the, uh, and for the Pakistanis, when nothing makes sense, bring in India. So India is behind what is happening. India is funding these guys. Are Baba, for 20 years, you sponsored these fellows. Yeah. Now suddenly you are saying India is sponsoring them. So if India is so omnipotent, you might as well give up. So, but you know, I, I, nobody takes the Pakistanis seriously anymore. They are so pathetic. It's, it's pointless talking about them. We'll take a short break now. Back in a bit. Welcome back. We are talking to Sushant Sareen on Afghanistan. Uh, we are talking about uh, Pakistan and the Afghans. The current uh, fighting we've seen at the border, you know, shelling and all that has taken place. Is the prelude to something bigger? Is this kind of tit-for-tat thing going to go on? No, it's. I think it's a continuation of what has been happening. There have been attacks by the Pakistanis in the past inside Afghanistan. Mostly undeclared. This was the first time I think they've declared an attack. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they've carried out some airstrikes in the past, some maybe drone strikes. Uh, they've also carried out some covert operations, I believe. Uh, there have been, you know, the odd IED blast going off, which is targeting some TTP guy or the other. Mm. There have been some clashes inside Afghanistan. So some stuff has been going on, but the Afghans have also, the Taliban have also played it down. The Pakistanis have also not declared it. So, it's in a sense, it's a continuum. But what has happened over the last two days has kind of ratcheted up tensions because now it's much more declared. The Taliban are coming out and saying, okay, fine, if you want to go down this road, we'll go down this road. I don't think it's going to lead to an open conflict. You never know. But my own assessment is that it won't lead to a very open kind of hostility is breaking out. But I think the level of uh, hostilities are going to be ratcheted up on both sides. Uh, some of the restraints that the Taliban would show uh, probably are not going to be there anymore. Uh, does that mean that they're going to declare open warfare? No. Uh, but they will make warlike noises. Uh, they will lift some of the restraints which they used to put. Uh, and at the same time, they will keep making entreaties and approaches and outreaches to the Taliban, uh, to the Pakistanis. Uh, but the both sides will play this game with each other to some extent. But I think that relationship is quite broken now. Uh, and as things move forward, they're only going to deteriorate. They're not getting any better. Uh, the Taliban are also now looking for options outside of Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, you know, there were reports that the Taliban are planning to invest something like $35 million or something in Chabahar port. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that is because of the kind of obstruction uh, that the Pakistanis are putting on Afghan transit trade coming out of Pakistan. So, they are saying, okay, fine, if you are going to be doing this, then we'll divert our trade to Iran. 
so there is that stuff which is also starting to happen and uh, so they are looking for options outside of pakistan so the moment that dependence on pakistan reduces uh, the incentive or the disincentive for them also reduces the disincentive in terms of attacking pakistan also reduces there is uh, there is a lot of bad blood partly uh, because of what pakistan has done with the refugees partly because how pakistanis uh, treated uh, the taliban leadership when they were in exile in pakistan so there is the, a history of bad blood as well now as long as the taliban needed the pakistan you know they took a lot of stuff which was coming their way silently now they don't need to do it so now they will pay them back in the same coin what's our sense of what the chinese are doing look i think there isn't much that the chinese are doing right they are there they are trying to show that they have a presence um, they kind of rattle the cage by saying okay fine now we are going in for lithium mines yeah. like they went in for copper mines 20 years nothing has happened right there is a bloody tin shed somewhere in the middle of nowhere and nothing beyond that uh i not so sure if the chinese are actually going to start investing billions of dollars to develop some of those mines because given the kind of unsettled conditions there are if you develop a mine how the hell are you going to take the stuff out yeah you know it's very easy to say that okay fine you're looking at a flat map and you say okay fine there is this tiny sliver of territory we can go from badakhshan into you know sinkyang yeah nobody has studied the terrain out there <laughs> yeah. you know have, have anybody seen what the terrain is like uh, so i i don't think the chinese investments are really going anywhere just yet they might in the future um there has been some kind of bait which has been given to the uh, the taliban that you know you can become part of cpec now cpec is a dead organization yeah, yeah. anyways mm-hmm. and nobody knows what becoming part of cpec means even the pakistanis they keep getting this telling everybody you know become part of cpec what does it mean to become part of cpec nobody knows what it means does it mean that i get to use the road does it mean that cpec is going to come into my country what the hell does it mean nobody knows the pakistanis themselves don't know where cpec is they they've got some electricity power plants and one or two roads what nothing beyond that what is cpec nothing it's just this eldorado is the pakistanis have built for themselves that suddenly will become the center of the globe and all kinds of nonsense so uh, it's a delusional dream uh, of the pakistanis but uh, but i don't think the chinese experience has been very good uh, in so far as their investments in pakistan are concerned they're not getting paid for that anyways all their payments are stuck up yeah the pakistanis are broke they can't pay in fact the pakistanis keep going to the chinese and asking for more money so the chinese are not giving any new money and uh, so would the chinese then go and you know incur even greater losses by going and investing in afghanistan where nobody knows how the future is going to play out um, will their people be secure uh, will maybe for now they will be but who knows how the future is going to play out so i think everybody is looking at afghanistan with a lot of caution nobody is kind of gung ho and very bullish on it uh, and that's where things are at so this could be the new phase of the great game yeah yeah of course it's the beginning of the new one but we don't know how this great game is actually going to play out uh we can we can speculate on who are going to be the players a fact of the matter means that india is no longer sitting on the sideline you know we are not we are not watching from the sideline we are a player now, very much the question however is um, nobody knows what exactly the game is going to be what how exactly that game is going to unfold uh we can speculate on the cast of players but what will be the dynamics between those various players uh i think all of that is going to be a very confused picture for the foreseeable future on that note sushant thanks very much good talking to you pleasure yeah and great perspective thank you That's all we have on Strat News Global. Do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media. Thank you very much. Good day.